I want to encourage you to open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 22. I know some of you may be saying, well, wait a second, Luke 22, I haven't even had about eight sermons from Luke 22. Yes. And we have one more from Luke chapter 22 and almost all of chapter 23 next week. Six hour message. No. <laughs> Barbecue in the middle, right. Luke chapter 22, verses 39 to 46. This is our Lord's plea to his father that if there is any other way to redeem humanity, that the father would pull that plan out and Christ would be able to skip the cross. But listen to what he says. Beginning with verse 39. When Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him, on reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel for heaven, from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer, he went back to his disciples. He found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Now, this particular account is recorded for us in Matthew. It's recorded for us in Mark. It's recorded for us in Luke. They all have little different details, but every one of them help us understand Jesus when he was praying this desperate prayer to the Father, asking that this cup of suffering would be removed from him. Now, I want you to see a few things right off the bat. And there's nothing in your outlines to talk about these three things, but if you want to jot things down, you can. First of all, it is apparent that Jesus didn't want his disciples to fall into temptation. Three times, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he prays that they would not, he says, pray that you will not fall in temptation. He didn't ask them to pray that they wouldn't be tempted. Jesus knew the temptation was coming, but he didn't want them to be overwhelmed by the temptation. He didn't want them to run because of the temptation. He didn't want them to go into hiding because of the temptation. He didn't want them to, their faith to fail them because of the temptation. He wanted them to be strong, but there was only one way that they would remain strong, and that was if they prayed. But they fell because they didn't pray. The second thing I want you to see is that it says that Jesus went and he knelt down. He knelt down to pray. Now, kneeling may be common today. You may find yourself when you're in deep prayer, getting on your knees and bringing your prayers before God. But kneeling was very unusual back in the day of Jesus. The usual position back then in prayer was to stand, to look into heaven, and to raise your hands to heaven and make your petitions known to God. But in Luke it says that Jesus knelt. But when you put the, the accounts of Matthew and Mark together with Luke, you get a clearer picture. Jesus is focusing now on the cup of suffering that he's about to drink. He knows that it is just a few hours away before he is going to suffer the wrath of God and the crucifixion of men. He's known it's been the plan throughout all of, all of ages. He is always focused on him being the sacrifice. He's focused on that for a long time. But now he knows his hour has come. He has told his disciples already that he's going to be arrested. He's going to be scourged. He's going to be crucified. He's going to die. 
and he's going to rise again. And we sort of sense that he has a deep commitment to fulfilling the Father's plan because at a certain point in time in his ministry, it says he set his face toward Jerusalem and he began to march into Jerusalem for the purpose of dying. He knew that through his death and through his resurrection that he would be raised from the dead. He would ascend into heaven. He would receive the glory that he had with the Father before he came to this earth. But now, a few hours before this crucifixion takes place, he goes before his father in deep anguish, and he says, I wonder, could there be a plan B? Could there be a plan B? His soul became so distressed and so sorrowful and so heavy, he felt like he was going to die. The weight of this distress drove him to his knees and his face to the ground. And he pours his heart out before the Father. He knew what was coming. He knew the sleepless night that was ahead. He knew the trials. He knew the beatings. He knew the scourging. He knew the crown of thorns. He knew the journey that he would experience as he walked up the hill toward Golgotha, carrying that cross. He knew the nails. He knew the abuse of the people. But worse than that, he knew that now he was going to be made our sin. He knew that he was going to become the sin bearer of the entire world. And as the sin bearer, it was beyond his imagination because of his incredible purity. Jesus had never, ever sinned in all of his life and all of eternity. He was gloriously pure and he was going to become the sin bearer. And he knew that when he became the sin bearer, he was going to bear the wrath of God against our sin. And he also knew that separation from the Father was coming for the first time in all of eternity. And he could hardly bear the thought. It was grieving him and sending him into such distress, he thought his soul was going to die. How much anguish was he in? Well, the scriptures tell us that his capillaries and his body began to break and blood droplets mixed with the sweat. He was in such anguish and he was so close to death that the father sent an angel from heaven into the garden of Gethsemane to give him strength. You know, I thought about that this week. What did the angel do? Did he just touch him and give him strength or... Did he talk to Jesus? Did he say to Jesus, listen, I've just come in to tell you that the Father loves you beyond words. I just want to tell you that the, the Father isn't going to remove this cup of suffering from you. Even when the wrath of the Father falls on you, I want you to know that the Father's love has not changed. I don't know what he said. But whatever he did, Jesus found strength from that angel. That's why Jesus was on his knees with his face in the ground. He was going to begin to suffer the wrath of God against sin. And he and his father were going to experience for the first time in all of eternity the separation that sinners experience with God. And he could hardly bear. And the third thing I want you to see is this. I want you to give the disciples a little break. You know, you'd have done the same thing. Jesus left eight, then he left three. He told them to stay there and pray lest they fall into temptation. But the Bible says in Luke that these men were asleep because they were exhausted from sorrow. It had been an exhausting week for them. They had been marching into Jerusalem and they knew 
that as they marched into Jerusalem, that if Jesus was arrested, they would be arrested. If Jesus was killed, they would come after them and kill them. Nobody likes to enjoy that talk, thinking about They had experienced the Passover with Jesus, but while they were experiencing the Passover, Jesus was talking about himself being the sacrifice for the sins of the world. And they also heard Jesus say to them that one of the 12 was going to betray them. And they heard Jesus say to Peter, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the night is over. And they go to the garden and the pressure and the sorrow and the fear has caught up with them. And so they block it out by closing their eyes. But Jesus had said to them, pray and watch, lest you fall into temptation. And with those three things out of the way, I want us to answer the question, how to pray? How should we pray in the face of major crises? And this is where your outline picks up. And the first thing I want us to do is answer this question. What I do, or take a look at this statement. What I do before the crisis determines how much strength I will have in the crisis. And I want us to look at it in terms of praying, obedience, and humility. Let's take a look at a praying, okay? It says that Jesus went out as usual to the mountain to pray. He had gone there over and over and over again. Why? So he could prepare himself for this moment, for this time. But his disciples, they slept. Regularly, Jesus had been in prayer about this pending cup of suffering. He knew it was coming, but the disciples, they didn't pray. And when the temptations came, they ran. Jesus knew his hour was coming, so he prepared himself in prayer. The disciples knew Jesus was going to be betrayed. The disciples knew that Peter was going to deny Christ three times, but they didn't prepare to walk in obedience so they would fulfill God's will for their life. Now, I know that there are numerous stories out there of God stepping in and showing his power and his glory even when people weren't praying. You can hear those stories, you read those stories. But that's not the norm. The pattern for all of us is this. How I prayed before the trial determines how I stand through the trial. I'm gonna say it again. How I pray before the trial determines how I stand through the trial. There's a verse of scripture in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. It says, be devoted to prayer or devote yourself to prayer. Watch. Let me try to explain what it means to be devoted to prayer. To be devoted means to find a way to make prayer happen, even if it's not easy. It, be, it doesn't mean... Go and spend hours in prayer, although if you want to, you can. It doesn't mean take a full day off for prayer and fasting. If you want to, you can, but that's not what it means. It means to make prayer a priority. To make sure that prayer is happening in your life. Now, there's been a lot that has been said about prayer by many preachers. And um, a lot of things that are said about prayer really sit well with introverts. Now, if you're an introvert, you are your own best friend, right? And you don't mind being alone in prayer for a while. And taking Jesus with you sounds kind of cool if you're an introvert. But if you're an extrovert, uh, being alone for any period of time, even if Jesus is coming along with you, sounds a little unpleasant. But whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, 
The truth is, we are to make prayer a priority. Otherwise, we're to make sure prayer is happening in our life because it will prepare us for temptations that are coming. Now, I also want you to understand this. Being devoted to prayer doesn't mean that I have to really be into it. I know some of you are going, oh, he said it. You don't really have to be into prayer to be devoted to prayer. Um, if I'm into something, I don't need to be encouraged to be devoted to it. A couple of illustrations. You do not tell me. You don't need to tell me to be devoted to watching the Philadelphia Eagles play football. I will cancel church services to watch that, okay? There's nothing that goes on in the afternoon when the Eagles are playing, okay? I don't have to be, you know, you also don't have to tell me to be devoted to eating. I really enjoy eating. But when I am told to be devoted to something, it means that I am to know that that something is very important and it's very urgent. And God says, be devoted to prayer. And therefore, I deliberately, and we are to deliberately make prayer a priority. Now, let's take a look at obedience. Our prayer life will affect our obedience. Everyone who reads the Gospels knows that Jesus was a man of prayer. And um, it was vital to him. And in John chapter 17, verse 4, Jesus is praying to his father and he says, I have, you, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. Otherwise, everything you told me to do, I have done it. Why did he accomplish that? Because he was a man of prayer. Now, there are people that do foxhole praying. You know what foxhole praying is? It means you're in a mess. And you can't get out. And you say to God, I promise you if you get me out of this mess, I will never do or I will do this. And you know, and sometimes God steps in. But again, that's not the norm. The norm is to be this. I pray. I make prayer a priority. I am devoted to prayer. I make prayer happen in my life. I set time to pray. Even if I don't think it's important, I do it anyway. And then God says, and I'll be there when you go through the trials and you will not fall. Another way to put it is this. Obedience on the front end greatly impacts the strength that I have during the trial. Obedience in the front end greatly affects the strength that I have during the trial. Uh, Jesus was finishing up one of the greatest teachings he did. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And when he's just about ready to conclude it, he says this to the people. It's found in Matthew chapter 7. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice or obeys them is like a man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. So what Jesus is saying is the person who walks in obedience, when the storm comes and beats on his life, he weathers the storm and he doesn't fall. Then he goes on to say this, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, does not obey, is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew great against the house, and it fell with a great crash. So what Jesus is saying there is this, the man who doesn't obey the teachings of Christ will find the storms too much to bear. And here's the point. Obedience won't keep you from the trials. It strengthens you 
through the trials. Please understand, just because you obey God doesn't eliminate the trials. But obedience does prepare us for the trials. Now let's put prayer and obedience together. Being devoted to prayer helps me be obedient. And obedience prepares me for the trial. So you got to have prayer in order to be obedient. In order to survive the trial, you've got to be obedient. So you've got to have both, prayer and obedience. Now, I want to read for you a passage of scripture. Uh, it's a long passage. It's in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 24 to 33. Wisdom has been personified, but listen to what it says, because when you're listening to it, it's God speaking to us, and it may give you a whole new perspective about obedience. But since you refuse to listen to me, listen when I call, and no one pays attention when I stretch out my hand, since you disregard all my advice and do not accept my rebuke, I in turn will laugh when disaster strikes you. I will mock when calamity overtakes you. When calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and tr trouble to overwhelm you, then they will call on me and I will not answer. They will look for me, but not find me. Since they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, since they would not accept my advice and spurn my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. Here's the key. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. What the writer of Proverbs is saying is if you want to stand strong during the storm, Make prayer a priority in your life so you walk in obedience. And the third way we're going to look at this is through humility. When Jesus was praying in the garden, he began by saying, if, this is, if it's at all possible, let the cup pray or pass for me. And then he says, but not my will, but your will be done. There's a lot of humility in his request for plan B. If it's possible, Lord, I would like to see plan B. And all things are possible for God, isn't it? So he could have had plan B, but not my will, but yours be done. You know, when it comes to prayer and our life, we got to remember God is God and we are not. You say, well, how's that apply to Jesus? Well, Jesus knew that God was his father and he was the son. And so he humbled himself. He took on the servant, the nature of a servant. He took on the appearance of a man and he humbled himself unto death, even the death of a cross. So here's the point. You can express your will to God, but always come back to, but not my will. Your will be done. Now, here's point two. You say, I thought we just had three points. You had A1, AB, and AC. Now you get point two. If I'm going to pray like Jesus during my desperate times, my prayers will be, number one, they'll be brief. You know, I want to let you know something. God is not impressed with how long I pray or by my incredible vocabulary. Prayer is not a speech. I know you have heard people pray and you would get, you say, come on, get on with it. Stop trying to teach me while you're praying. You know, <laughs> listen to what Matthew says. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. For they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. So just ask. Boy, I'll tell you, I'm so glad Jeanette didn't start her prayer 
back in 1983. Dear Heavenly Father, I am so thankful that I'm your child. Oh, hi. <laughs> she said, Jesus, save us. That was it. And he did. Now, keep your, your prayers are going to be brief. Number two, your prayers will be brutally honest. I can't think of anything more honest than what Jesus did. He knew the plan. He was committed to the plan. He had told his disciples earlier that evening, this is my body broken for you. This covenant is a covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. But now he is moments away from carrying out that plan. And he says, I don't want to do it. And he says to his father, is there any other way? And the father says, no. This is the only way. He is so distressed that angel comes and strengthens him. And you think he's going to get up and go to the cross. He goes and he sees his disciples sleeping. And then he comes back and drops on his knees and on his face again and says to his father, Father, I, I don't want to do this. I need plan B. If it's all possible, give me plan B. And the father says, no, this is how it's going to be. And he does it again. He says to his father, I want plan B, but not my will, but yours. And then after three times, he, it's settled. He arises from his knees. The temptation is over. He gets off the ground. He's bloodied, but he's not bowed. He's ready to accept the will of the father. He's resolved himself to do the father's plans. This is what I'm going to do. He's now ready to face the betrayer. He's ready for the kiss. He's ready to face the Jewish people, leaders. He's ready to face the Romans. He's ready for the cross. He's ready to crush the serpent's head. He's ready to be made sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. He's ready to face death and he's ready to triumph over the cross. But he had to get ready. And so for three times he says to his father, could there be another plan? Could there be another plan? I want another plan. And the father said no, all three times. But he was brutally honest. I love that type of honesty. Now you might sit back and say, well, can God handle my honesty? You know, he already knows what you're thinking. You might as well tell him. You say, well, how do I tell him? I'm going to tell you this. Don't be disrespectful. Don't start swearing at him. Don't call him the man upstairs. He's God Almighty. But when you're desperate, be brief. Be brutally honest. And last, that third... Be shamelessly persistent. We'll go back to Jesus. Three times he says, is there another way? And God says, no. Is there another way? And God says, no. Is there another way? And his father says, no. Now, here's the truth. If you are desperate and you really want something, don't quit until you have received what you've asked for. Or you know for a fact that God said no. Or as you're praying, God changes your heart. And you no longer want what you went after at first. But don't quit praying until you got one of those things. You either got what you wanted or God said no or God changed your heart. And somewhere for Jesus, somewhere between that first prayer of anguish and the end of the third request that he made in anguish, Jesus became ready and resolved to finish his father's plan. Be brief, be brutally honest, be shamelessly persistent. Someone said to me a few weeks ago, I don't know if I'm praying against the father's will. Jesus did. He knew what the Father's will was, and he went to the cross, and he's asking for plan B. 
That's okay. But that leads us to the final point. Prayer needs to be humbly offered. Jesus said, if it's possible, could I have plan B, but not my will, but your will be done. And sometimes when we're in desperate situations, we're saying to God, if it's your will, please do this. But if you're not going to do this, your will be done. And sometimes we don't know what his will is. And so we just keep praying so that we don't fall. When the temptation comes to lose faith, to do something that God doesn't want us to do. So we've got to offer our prayers humbly. Let's pray together. I'm going to ask the praise team to come up. Lord, I pray that you'll teach us to anticipate temptation by being men and women that make prayer happen in our lives. We want to make prayer happen so we can walk in obedience. And so we are prepared and strengthened for the temptations that will come our way. And when life crashes in around us and beats on our lives like a fierce storm, may we pray like Jesus did. May it be brief. May it be brutally honest. May it be shamelessly persistent. May it be offered with humility. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.